everybody, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classic's Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. Our mission is not to further vilify these individuals, but instead to challenge conventional wisdom and re-examine what has been accepted as fact. You'll see new evidence and hear new testimony. All we ask of you is to go in with an open mind. In this show, we'll count down the reasons why you can't blame John McEnroe for his notorious behavior on the tennis court. Admittedly, for those of us who feel you're ultimately responsible for your own actions, this is a tall order, even for us. But before we defend him, let's take a look at why McEnroe is widely regarded as the game's most obnoxious champion. <laughs> Tennis was still thought of as a gentleman's game, and everything is elegant, and there are white pants and grass courts, and nobody insults anybody. Did you see one <laughs> call? Couldn't you see anything? That cost me the damn set! And that ball was out! The set was over! In the late 70s were suddenly the Sex Pistols, okay? Punk rock. Well, he's Johnny Rotten. And he's Johnny Rotten going to Wimbledon. His eyes were twirling in his head. And I'll never forget that because he kind of kept that state the whole match. You're pathetic, you know that? You are the worst umpire that I've ever seen in my life. Your skin crawled. You kept saying, oh, don't do that. Oh, please don't do that. You're such a jackass. You need to ever stick that He wasn't embarrassed to do it. He'd say he was embarrassed afterward, but I don't believe him. You can't let John Macro off the hook for his repeated tantrums. It's funny, these guys always cite things that bug them that make them throw tantrums, but I never saw Rod Laver throw a tantrum, and he might be the greatest player ever. But the brat was also brilliant. In a professional career that spanned 15 years, McEnroe won four U.S. Opens and three Wimbledons among his 77 singles titles. I think people understand what he did on court and what a genius he was on court. But he's still remembered as a big mouth. Yeah. You cannot be serious! That ball was on the line! I found it painful at times. So it was boorish and, and painful, and I was embarrassed for him. Somebody come out and take him home and take him to the woodshed. John always had this great gift for barking at the people in the front rows, in the box seats. He, he, I used to watch him yell at a guy who, like an hour from then, was going to be handing him his check. People like you are absolute idiots. He just would make you put your forehead down on the table in front of you and say, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't be this kind of jerk. I've never seen anybody else like that. Never seen anybody with that sort of sustained hysteria. And it was the uh, headlines in papers and, you know, send the brat home. We're not going to have a point taken away because this guy's an incompetent fool. You know that? Let's face it, I mean, he did stand smack in the middle of center court and scream at the top of his lungs, this place is the pits of the world. No, that's not what I said. I said he was the pits of the world. That's exactly what he is. And Here was McEnroe, a rich snot, thought he was better than everybody else. And it was a stereotypical rich brat. Answer my question! The question, jerk! Oh, the headlines are easy. McNasty, Mac the Brat. He was a big star and a bigger target. We're getting ready to present the top five reasons you can't blame John McEnroe for his repeated outbursts. But first, here are several other reasons we call the best of the rest. Bjorn Borg's early retirement. There were never any eruptions on court with Borg. John never tried to do anything with Bjorn. I think he respected him too much. He was able to behave much better when he played against Bjorn because the whole match was so intense and so interesting for John. He felt that he couldn't waste one ounce of strength screwing around. You know, he couldn't do pits of the world. He couldn't do it, you incompetent fool. He had to be focused on this guy. In 1981, McEnroe beat Borg in straight sets at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. A year later, the 26-year-old Borg surprised the tennis world by announcing his retirement. McEnroe, at 23, was suddenly without his arch threat. When Borg left, I think it was, it was tough for John to stay motivated because Borg was the ultimate. I think John looked around and said, this, this kind of blows. <laughs> I thought it was going to be me and the blonde guy from Sweden. I couldn't believe that it ended so soon. You know, I think I would have been a better player had he stayed around and 
I think the sport would have been better off, and it's, it's just too bad. Another best of the rest. Endorsements. It paid to be a brat. McEnroe has earned more than $100 million from tennis and commercial endorsements. It was the 77 Wimbledon, and they were talking about the great young Americans coming up, and all the U.S. tennis authorities said, except stay away from that McEnroe. He's got a bad temper. And so I immediately went out and said, where is he playing? And they said, out on court 14. I made a beeline for court 14. Endorsers loved McEnroe because whether it was selling shavers, whether it was selling clothes and shoes, it gave your brand an attitude. You know, McEnroe, it's really strange because he was the ultimate anti-hero, and he's just on every commercial. When you're talking about endorsements, one thing is to be a great player. Another thing is to have, you know, a lot of charisma or interest or, uh, you know, creating an emotion. And, you know, you could see that he had that from day one. What? John McEnroe got some pretty tough treatment from a lot of the tabloids. There always seemed to be some sort of, of confrontation happening. The Wimbledon report. It's been a day of spectacular tennis and occasionally spectacular temperament. After the match, during a news conference which was closed to television cameras, McEnroe traded bitter insults with British journalists. And he just starts cursing out the reporter. He said, I told you I'm only going to talk about tennis, not my personal life, and storms out. Meanwhile, the room now, chairs are flying and people are screaming. And I get myself into a fight with a, with a British reporter. Don't point your finger at me, mister. That is a small indication of the strong feelings John McEnroe arouses in Great Britain. Welcome back. You've seen and heard the evidence and a few reasons that didn't make our top five. Without any further ado, here's reason number five why you can't blame John McEnroe. You shut up. The behavior of Ily Nastasi and Jimmy Connors. The tennis world was already prepared for the coming of John McEnroe by this pair of fiery stars. Well, I mean, look at me, I kill you. Ily Nastasi was the first one to, to really act like a jerk. Well, they saw Nastasi doing it and I think they got the idea, hey, this is, this is how you're supposed to do it. We need a, a, a team of doctors and psychotherapists to talk about Nastasi. I think Nastasi just had a couple of wires that not connected. It was definitely out. Not definitely out. It was out. I'm out here grinding my butt off out here trying to win this match, and you're going to do this to me? We tend to forget now about how wild Jimmy Connors was and how dirty he was. And he and Ellie Nastasi were the really bad boys. Nastasi was at his nastiest at the 1979 U.S. Open. Nastasi had done everything to throw McEnroe off and couldn't. Nastasi had been just uh, outrageous. Frank Hammond, the umpire, went through all the steps to disqualification. He said, you're finished. Game, set, match, McEnroe. Finally, Bill Talbert, the tournament director, he felt there might be a riot. And he, instead of having Nastasi removed, removed the umpire. And they got him to walk out of the chair. And the referee, Mike Blanchard, came in, you know, he was an old, older gentleman, come in and had to sit in for the last set. McEnroe uh, is a pretty smart young man at that point, and I think he learned a, a lot of those antics and tricks from the great Ellie Nastasi, without question. And maybe that night in New York was uh, the crowning moment. Are you up again? Connors, of course, had picked up the mantle from Ily Nastasi. Keep your mouth shut out here. Well, now here was McEnroe, who was might, may, perhaps going to take it to new levels. You can do that without getting up, all right? Understand me? It's making me sick. There's no doubt that he made me look good. There's no doubt when he came in, he allowed me the privilege to still continue on in a little bit less than full manner and get by with it. I don't think people have watched Connors play much in Nastasi, you know, because if they did, I think that, you know, I'm not sure that I even get, would, would win the battle with those guys. Reason number four why you can't blame John McEnroe for his repeated outbursts. 
Mac's upbringing. McEnroe was to the manor born. Raised in Douglaston, a quiet upscale section of Queens, New York, he learned early on that the calm approach to conflict did not work in his house. There's no both of my family. They understand that I curse every now and then. You can definitely argue that John Patrick McEnroe was the product of his time and his environment, starting with his parents. When he was inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame in 1999, McEnroe provided a glimpse of what may have transpired behind the closed doors of his childhood. I must have said something to him 5,000 times. John, you, you can't do that. It's outrageous. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help your game. I'm going to show you exactly how he said that to me, okay? You can't do that! I've told you 5,000 times not to do that! John Cena grew up problems with some of John's behavior. But again, being a lawyer, he often saw John's way, too. He said, you know what, if that linesman had had his, his eyes open, it wouldn't have happened. My parents uh, were Irish-American parents, and they, they yelled a lot at each other. It was a normal thing, living in New York. A lot of people yell. You know, I don't, this is normal to me. John came from a, a great background, a very uh, nice parents and intelligent boy, but he was completely and utterly unable to accept authority. John was coming through an era in the 70s where all of things that the traditional elements of sport, the flat top, the, you know, the mom, church, and apple pie, all that was changing. And the rebel was being embraced in sport. McEnroe's dislike for authority may have been deepened when he attended an elite private high school in Manhattan, where aggressive candor can be a tool of social survival for those whose blood was not deep blue. There's an old saying, you can always tell a New Yorker, but you can't tell him much. McEnroe is, is a New Yorker. He's a New Yorker in his crassness and his rudeness. How far does a ball have to be out before you see one? In his savvy, how cagey he is. Just do me a favor. That's all I ask. But it ought to be a great point, though, right? You walk around the city in such a defensive crouch most of the time, you know. You have to protect yourself physically, you have to protect yourself emotionally. It always amazed me that people would look at me on a tennis course, particularly here when I played in New York, and think, you know, what is he doing? I mean, uh, what's wrong with him? Because that was exactly the way uh, things were in New York. Reason number three why you can't blame John McEnroe for his repeated outbursts. The tennis establishment enabled McEnroe. It wanted players who were not only talented, but entertaining. McEnroe was its man. The game was at fault in terms of, of allowing him to do uh, a lot of the things that he got away with. It was a sign of the times, and so uh, you can't blame uh, McEnroe totally. There's no describe the way I think about you. you know, that words cannot possibly describe how low I think you are. People who didn't normally watch tennis would watch McEnroe, like people go to watch a car smash because they wanted to see him explode. There were times when he went too far, but tennis is desperate for characters. So you can't blame somebody for being a character and doing a bit of good for the sport. It's about time someone new, refreshing, came in like McEnroe and put a bit of oomph into tennis. It came down to like a love-hate relationship what the people had to him. And he was good for tennis, Sean. They, tennis needed him. If tennis needed him, McEnroe also needed tennis. The two became entwined in a double standard, with the brat often paying the price. Besides being able to do that, the guy was a genius. You know, got to give him his props. He was a great player, a great touch, unbelievable volleyer, great attacking player, the most unique serve, effective serve. Millions of Americans who never picked up a tennis racket would watch McEnroe for the show, also because he's a great athlete. We're all hypocrites. We criticize McEnroe for his bad things but he could draw in crowds like nobody in modern times. As soon as you say the name John McEnroe, there's an instantaneous reaction, and it's an emotional reaction that people have. And John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors were movie stars. You have two or three great personalities, that's all you need, and all of a sudden your sport is hot. There was a time in the early to middle 70s on into the early 1980s when tennis was a ratings dominant attraction. The press loved the guy because if I'm a tennis writer and I'm writing about the tennis event, I get X amount of space. But if I write about McEnroe, 
it doubles. You see, a referee last night threatened that he might ban you from Wimbledon. He might actually disqualify you if you have any more of this behavior. Does that worry you? Yeah, I'm extremely worried about that. He felt when he stepped on the court, if he just played a match, and it was just normal, it wasn't enough, that the crowd wanted him to go crazy. He understood why people were coming in, and he would give it to him. Cannot let a man get away with that on court. You either love him or you hate him, but you want to see him. And, and if he just went out and put a virtuoso on a tennis match, people felt deprived. They wanted to see something. They want to see him yell at somebody, scream at somebody. It was right for him to be who he was. He was playing at a great time. He was getting through the roof ratings um, because of who he was. You can't blame McEnroe, because he spread the gospel. He put the fannies into the stadiums. Which brings us to the number two reason why you can't blame McEnroe for his repeated outbursts. The officiating. Officials in the early part of open tennis stunk up the joint. They were awful. They were not professional. We had one lady fall asleep on the court while we, in, in the middle of a match. Fall asleep. In the 70s, uh, there wasn't the professional line crews that you see today at the Grand Slams. We had guys who were just club members. Yeah, you know, I, I volunteer. It would be like, okay, we're playing an NBA game, and you know what, tonight we're going to use the high school reps. The umpires, the, the guy who's supposed to control the match, were not anywhere close to what they are today. So Connors, Nastasi, and McEnroe started to complain about it. And they'd say, these guys are incompetent boobs. The linesman who should be in his chair isn't. Here he comes. A title's on the line, and some bozo who's an average player at the club is uh, out. Wait a second, I'm pouring my guts into this match. And you're telling me some bozo back there who, you know, this is just like a side job. If I'm professional, shouldn't you be professional? And that would drive them nuts. It's easy to say now I should have been more forgiving of that, but at the time it was inexplicable to me that they can miss as many calls as they missed. That ball is this high over the net. Perfect ace. What frustrated me was not only did they miss the call, but in addition to that, they sort of blamed me for the fact that I'd call them on it. You could manipulate the umpires if you were uh, a manipulative person, and McEnroe was the master of that, if you will. I believed that initially that it was something that I was going to change, you know, that I was going to actually get rid of these bad guys and actually be some guys that would be good come in and take their place. That just didn't happen. Is it true that I have to apologize to the, all the umpires of the world? What do you, what do you people think? That's, that's what I thought. The hell with them. Reason number one, McEnroe's tantrums worked. Hey, you speak up a little louder, I can't quite hear you perfectly enough. There are very few athletes who can raise their game out of anger. McEnroe used the bitterness and the anger to dig down and make himself fight harder and play harder and, and raise his game. He is so good at just manipulating the tempo and the timing and what goes on on the tennis court. 30 seconds, right? I have 30 seconds to complain more, right? It is just really kind of navigating through a minefield because at any time, it's just going to blow up. One night I played him in L.A. I got him rattled. I'm up 3-2 here in the third. And he got a argument in the stands with a fan that somehow he turned into 15 minutes of wanting this guy removed and getting the, the referee to come out and everything like that. I got a little tight, a little tentative, thinking in my mind, I got the guy beat. Wrong. I mean, 16 out of 17 points, I lose for the bad, it's over. There was some part of him anyway that, that must have liked that me against the world sort of thing, and it got his venom going, and he played better. The day of the match that I'm going to play John in the paper, the headline is John ripping me. And I've never spoken to him, never hit with him, never met him, any of this stuff. Go into the locker room, John won't even look at me. He's so mad at me. We go into the court, and I'm in my pants. Not only was he mad at me before the match, he was mad at me in the match, and he was still pissed off after he whipped me. Although he retired from the tour in 1992, the legend of McEnroe's skill and scorn rages on. I've seen great athletes in all kinds of sports. 
I really think I've only seen one genius, and that's John McEnroe. Without the temperament, without the fiery mood, would he have been as great a champion? Would he have been as great a player? There you have it. Reason number one why you can't blame John McEnroe for his repeated outbursts on the tennis court. For many, sportsmanship took a big hit in the McEnroe era, but the entertainment value of that time is proving hard to replicate. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for joining us.